Hi, Mike. Hey, hey, Alan. Just thought I would check in and make sure that all's good. Yeah, you're looking good. And I'm just going to do a quick. Uh... So I've enabled uh, screen sharing. Yeah, there we go. So I've turned the uh, subtitles on. I don't know if you can see that coming up. I can. Where do you do that? It's very cool. It's a, it's a PowerPoint feature. Okay, I've got PowerPoint. So it's just something you enable when you're creating your presentation or something? Um, when, you, when you're doing it. Yeah. So I'm hoping <laughs> it'll uh, work tonight. Yeah, that'd be great. And we'll give it a test anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think all, all is good. I will just uh, do the stop share there. And I guess I can just uh, wait by and you reckon you got about 10 or 15 minutes of club business and I will yep. starting at seven. Yeah, that's right. So probably like 710, 715, we'll be ready to let you run with it. Yeah, sounds good. And I think um, what I suggest we do is I've got a few kind of break points in my, my talk. Uh huh. And I figure I could kind of take questions at those points a little bit as okay, well as sure. at the end. Sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe if you let people know that, they'll hang on to their questions for that or if yeah. they can't hang on to them, we can put them in the chat and you can just look at the chat at that point. Yeah. Yeah, it's harder for me to see the chat than it is. Um, I think, uh, let me just check here. Yeah. There's the video. Hopefully that's working. You're not sharing right now, but. Right, yeah. That would be the key there. Yeah, that's working. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll just sort of stand by. I'll turn my video on and audio off for the moment. Okay. And um, wait till uh, we're ready to go. All right, sounds good. And uh, I'm going to record this. So then afterwards, what I've done is uh, I kind of upload it to YouTube and then I send the, the file to uh, Dave O and he can put it onto our site so people who weren't able to tune in can, can see your presentation. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, doke. well, I will stop my video first and then I will mute myself. Okay. Do, do, do. Oh, there we go. Just
Hey, I'm trying to pair this up with my TV. Ooh, you techie, you. <laughs> well, Diane Copeland's the techie, and I'm just trying to follow her directions, but so far, not so great. <laughs> mm. OK, now how? Let's try this again. Open Zoom on your phone, join a meeting, open Chromecast, Chromecast screener. Okay. Might be backing out here again. Yeah, this will do. <laughs> Stick with what works, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was. I can't. I can't figure out how to click on the uh, Google Home without leaving the Zoom. Should be possible somehow, but maybe not on your device easily. I guess. Uh, she has the same. No, I think it's me. <laughs> okay. Tap screen mirror. I've read 
Hi. I thought I'd connect with you early to see if we could get the um, um, my images up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't see a button down here for me to take over. Well, I've, I've enabled screen sharing to other people, so yeah. you should be able oh, to share screen. I see a button down here. Yeah, that'd be it. Give it a try. Yeah, you've started. I can see okay. a bunch of calendar pictures here. Can you see one in the center? No, nope. I see about a dozen for all the months, I guess. Okay. I'm going to stop the sharing and try that again. Um, okay. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> she waved. <laughs> I see Roger's hand. Ooh. <laughs> okay, how's that? Yeah, that's Alan? better. That's better. I see just the one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. I got it. All righty. I'm here to make it full screen. <laughs> well. Hi there, Tony. Hello. Hi. Are we muted? Uh, nope. You can mute yourself if you want. Don't do that. Where am I? Come on. Oh, here. Are you going to sort of wink in and out again, Gail? Or, uh, yep, there she goes. Oh, I am. Whoa. Yeah. Very cool. Do you like the picture in the background? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It said KO, is it? No. Oh, no, no, that's um, that's in Soup Basin. Yeah. That's uh, on one of our paddles there. Uh, is that all the people who showed up today for the paddle? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's quite a few of us here, yeah. The hugs were nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> and that one person coughing? We saw a whale. We saw a whale. Yes, you saw him several times, I think. Mm -hmm. Hey, Vic. And some people had cake today. I heard that, yes. Some they people were, had a birthday today. They were not far down the beach, were they? If only we'd known, we could have gone. And yeah, yeah. It would have needed to be a much bigger cake, I said. We let, wouldn't let him blow out the candles because he would spit on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Dave-o. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dave. Hi, there. Hi, Dave. Where, we, where was Dave today? Dave was at home today. I don't know. God. Dave had a chiropractor appointment. Oh. <laughs> oh okay. Hi, Alan. Hi. Hi, Dels. Elsie. A picture of Mike Jackson. He's not moving. Mm. No, he's uh, he's already checked in and we've tested things and he's gone off to do other things. He'll join us again about seven or I told him we'd be ready for him about 10 or quarter after. So he's all set to go, though. <laughs> Whoa, Susan. Hi. OK, we got. Quite a few here now. That's good. Joanne. Hi, Joe. 
can change the picture. You put dead chickens. Or... <laughs> I don't care what you do. I just noticed I have way more people on the screen this time. I could never get any more than nine before. That's good for the iPad. Yeah, I've got uh, 16. All right. I think there's a setting that allows you to have up to 49. Not on an iPad, though. Yeah, the oh, iPad. No. Too small. Or challenge. Yeah, yeah. I think I might be able to get four, four more, three more. <laughs> Jane's iPhones. Six. Christmas lights up, anyone? Oh, hello. hello. <laughs> oh. Very nice. Busted. Okay. She's wearing red. That's great. And hoping December 9th will be freed up to do a Christmas paddle. On the 9th. Oh, you're getting into the early festivities. That's true. I might be by myself, though. <laughs> <laughs> we got nothing on for Christmas. Okay. Ooh, at a naturist resort? Yeah, that's what I was wondering, too. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Come look. Come look. Come say Hello, hi. Hello, Elsie. Hi. Is everybody? Hi. Hi. Hi, BJ. Hi, hi Jonathan. Says hi. 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 I already heard it, Mike. I know. It's <laughs> there's a few different slides, but not much. Okay. Good. <laughs> and it was good last time, guys. Good. You're in for a treat. <laughs> So I don't see who is, who is Renee Watson. Right here. You're a little you dark. Like you're a little, here, Renee. You need more light, Renee. Oh, do I? Okay. Yeah. Renee is uh, one of our members from uh, Parksville, actually. Ooh. Greetings. How's that? Nice uh, you, we you. can see you a little bit. Can you see me? Google. More light. Yeah. Okay. More light would be better. Like the screen oh, mirror to there. You plug your phone in so it doesn't die. Look at Fred's background. Fred's I am not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I think Fred's background was taken in uh, Soup Basin. Fred's background <laughs> looks like medieval reconstructionists after a battle. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's Halloween. Oh, three years ago, four years ago. Like I say, it looks like a pre-COVID picture. <laughs> We're still getting more people signing in, so I'll just wait for another few minutes before uh, a few remarks, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Mike. Is that Tony Copping or Tony Playfair there? We got both. I'm here. Tony Copping's here. Tony, Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, BJ. Nice to see Hi. you. All right. I'll get a whole new screen. Hi, Deb. Hey, hey. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it sort of never gets old waving at each other, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Susan, haven't seen you in a while? Hey. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we've got a new member. Nice. Yeah, new member, you see that? Good, good. Welcome, Brian and Maya. Whereabouts are you? Have we got a visual on you? Wave. No, <laughs> no they have no visual. So far, we've just got a name on a blank thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh. No person. And Karen says, welcome. So yeah, you can use the chat if you want, or you can just, you know, wave. Okay, well, I'm not seeing too many more people coming in, so I'll, I'll keep admitting people as they arrive, but let's get started. It's after seven here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Alan Campbell. I'm your president right now. 
president by Zoom. It's a whole new experience. <laughs> Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know, maybe our third meeting uh, by Zoom uh, for our club monthly meetings. And uh, what I want to mention right away, in case I forget, is <clears throat> we normally don't have a monthly meeting in December uh, because we have a Christmas party and everybody's put a note in. Christmassy thing. Hi, hey, everyone. It's our first meeting. Oh. Hi. I think so. Uh, but oh. Here, uh, this uh, oh. next month, we are going to have a meeting, so I will send them. Okay, you can shut oh, yours off now. Okay. There's a little feedback. There's a little feedback. If you <laughs> you might want to shut your microphone off. Microphone off. Okay, so uh, I was saying that uh, we're going to have a meeting next month. It'll be December 9th, which is a Wednesday. It's uh, the second Wednesday of the month, uh, just so we're not crowding Christmas too much. Um, but anyway, we will have another one of these calls then. And I mention it because I want to plug a bit uh, the person who is going to give a talk at that and uh, people, and that's uh, Eva Keen and Patty Stevens of Go Kayak. And they're going to talk about their trip from Port Hardy around the capes and down to Tofino. Wonderful trip. And if you know uh, Eve and Patty, you know they're a lot of fun. And so I'm sure it'll be a great presentation. So remember that and I will be sending out a notice um, and uh, for the Zoom meeting as well. So that's just so I don't forget it. Uh, there were a couple other things, one of which is Fred Pischalski, who's on the call here, wants to talk about a calendar. Fred, over to you. You need to unmute, Fred. There he's <laughs> I just did. Can there people see the screen that's just come up? Yeah. Okay. I've, um, in the final stages of putting together the official um, Cisca calendar uh, for 2021, and um, it's going to go for sale. Um, I'm waiting for um, a sale. I get it printed by the same group every year, Vistaprint, and I wait until they um, have a sale and knock the prices down to half. Um, any profits that we make um, go to charity. Last year was um, Power to Be. Power to be. Um, we'll decide on next year's once we see we, if we, how much money we get. Um, because I haven't ordered the calendars, I don't know the final price, um, but it's gonna be somewhere around $20. So I'm just gonna go through and show you a few quick uh, pictures. I especially yeah. like January. <laughs> Oh, that's a Jane Jassic. That's that's a Jane picture. Yeah. So, um, so some of them are um, individual pictures. Some are composites. Um, but it's a pretty neat calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, money that goes for profits or to um, non charity. So um, I will ask people. It'll be in the newsletter. But I'm going to ask people to please send me an email at uh, Gail's email address which is gailmiller at shaw.ca. That information will also be in a newsletter. And this year, um, unfortunately, because we're not meeting, people are going to have to pick up the calendars. Um, that's the only way I can see them getting distributed. So those are the two caveats. We um, could maybe enlist the bikers to bike around. Oh, that would be a wonderful <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, you can, you can start yeah, as a new you can give me a you can give me a, a, a delivery list, route. delivery route. I can ride around and drop them off. Okay, we'll work out something. This is one that uh, Heather and Tony submitted, um, taken from last summer up on the Brooks. Isn't that incredible? That's wow. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that's it for me. Okay, thanks, Fred. That's uh, those are some great, great images, and I think Fred uh, asked for people to send them to him. So you, it looks like you got some great ones. Okay, uh, now let me just ask, I have one more thing to say, uh, but uh, let me just ask if anybody else has an announcement to make to the group we have assembled. Any, any other, anybody else have an announcement? One point, Alan? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I'd just like to remind everybody that they need to sign the new waiver for uh, 2021. Right. Uh, on, on December 31st. Any old waiver will be null and void. Right. And also, now would be a good time to start renewing memberships. Ah. Oh. 
Uh, so, so Alan? Yes, go. Do you want to mention how we're now property owners? <laughs> Why don't you do that, Roger? Well, I think Lynn Beek is probably the best one. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if Lynn's on yet. You go ahead. Anyways, um, in, instead of uh, Cisco having a Christmas party this year, Cisco decided to become a landlord. Uh, we donated money to the, uh, what, what's the name of that island? West South Bolinas. West Bolinas. So anyways, we, we, we uh, Cisco donated, was it $1,200 to uh, go towards buying the island. Uh, it'll hopefully be turned into a provincial park. Uh, some of our members have had experience uh, staying on the island. I believe Rob Zachary yeah. is one of them. And uh, Yeah, I've camped on it. So anyways, we're, we're now a property owner, a small property owner. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That was a really good effort. BC Marine Trails uh, spearheaded that, and uh, it was through the BC Parks Foundation that acquires land for uh, provincial parks. So we were glad to participate, and we thought it was a great way to uh, take the place of our Christmas party by donating the money we would have uh, subsidized our, our party. So thanks everybody for doing that. And I guess they, they have a regular, they might do this again next year or uh, it's a good thing. Nice to have those properties. Uh, the other uh, thing I was gonna mention is that uh, this actually also involves you Roger because it was Roger's idea which we supported that uh, since we're kind of consigned to this Zoom meeting business to try and make it a bit more fun uh, we thought we'd uh, give some stuff away. And so uh, haven't talked to Dave O about this, but Dave's gonna have to be our, uh, our drawer since he's the holder of the membership list. And starting with uh, the December 9th meeting, Dave, we'd yeah. like you to draw name, a name at random from the membership. Okay. And then that person will win uh, something which Roger has kicked it off by buying some safety gear. I don't know if you can mention a few of the things, Roger. Yeah, we've got uh, two deck lamps and uh, three paddle leashes. That's for uh, that's for the first uh, draw or draws. Okay. And uh, I've talked to Deb Leach about this. We're sort of co coordinating on this. And the rules pretty much are: you have to be a current member to be eligible. No attendance necessary. Uh, we'll get. Uh, probably Dave O to select uh, the lucky names and uh, that's it. That's it. Anyway, so we'll, <laughs> we, we may have to use the bike delivery service for that too, Rob, I don't know. We, we'll see if we can make sure all these places are uphill though, okay? Way. <laughs> <laughs> well, uphill both ways. Uphill both ways. <laughs> okay, uh, so the only other- um, I hope we, Renee something. Go ahead. I hope Renee wins something. Oh yeah, Renee. I'm I'm way uphill. <laughs> Alan, can I can I jump in for a second, Alan? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I put um, Gail's email address in the chat in oh, case yeah. anybody wants to write it down. And the second, um, I bought a copy. Is it going to show up? No. It's not hold it. Up. Hold it in front of yourself. Oh. <laughs> no. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Um, Cheryl Alexander's um, Dekaya, Dekaya, the book, book, and I'm going to donate it to our library. Okay. So, um, where is the library? Do we have it? Oh, libraries in our basement. So, <laughs> 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 libraries in three boxes in our basement. So, um, anybody wants to um, order a calendar and you can have it. <laughs> uh, one more, Alan. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the uh, Santa's Anonymous. Yes. You want to talk about that? Since you know more than I do about it. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, we also agreed that we would gift uh, Santa's Anonymous. That's the charity that we have, um, we have given money to before. We would gift them with monies which Beth Hasem uh, took the initiative herself to raise just from individuals. It wasn't really um, our club and it wasn't our club money. So it was just people who uh, she managed to buttonhole like me, for instance, uh, to uh, contribute money and in return get a rainbow colored Ikea bag. <laughs> you may see some of these Ikea bags which are very colorful. And if you see one, it means the person who has one has- No. Has uh. 
rather too no pure, lick. and it's gone. No lick. No lick. Santa's anonymous. <laughs> so uh, that's that's uh, the story about the uh, Santa's anonymous. They've been uh, given. I think it's close to six hundred dollars. Am I right there, Roger? Uh, I think about $580. Dollars. So kudos oh, to Beth. Oh, so kudos to Beth for uh, figuring out how to do that. And I don't know if you know that Beth is uh, in England right now looking after her 98 uh, year old mother. And uh, so we don't have a chance to say thanks uh, directly, but uh, I will uh, send her an email and uh, convey to her our appreciation. <laughs> as, uh, she was the one who got that all started. So, Alan, are you taping the presentation that she could maybe receive if you could send it? Yeah, and yeah. I, uh, tape it. The whole thing is being taped, even these unscripted comments. So, mind what you say. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be in glorious video. And we will actually uh, put that on the website. It uh, takes a bit of time, but I can, I can get Dave O to post that up on the website uh, not too long. <laughs> Uh, just one more thing and then I'll get Mike going here and that is to tell you that um, and I want to mention this again on December 9th when Eve is especially when Eve is with us uh, because uh, we sadly didn't get our spring training going this year it, it got cancelled because of this pandemic and of course uh, things aren't looking very hopeful right now but uh, I'm ever hopeful so we are planning spring training for 2021 and uh, it would be in March, about mid-March through to May. Uh, and I've got uh, five different suppliers. These are the commercial uh, companies that we work with. Uh, Eve at Go Kayak, we've got Ocean River, that's Gordon Brown. Uh, Mike Gilbert from BC Kayak Center in Vancouver is gonna participate this year. Blue Dog, uh, Dave Nichols up in uh, Mill Bay. And I'm missing somebody else. Who? Who? Skill? Skills, of course. BF, uh, J, uh, JF, Marlowe, and the, the Skills Gang. So anyway, they put together a whole series of courses. It's kind of like a calendar of courses. They're quite affordable. Uh, they're going to be top notch. I hope that you consider them. And we'll start promoting that in January once uh, Christmas is out of the way. But I thought I'd mention it to you. And we also want to promote these companies because these are really big assets for us here. Uh, we, we do have great kayaking around here. And we know we have to train and, and be safe with it. But one of the ways we can do it is by having, you know, these highly skilled uh, individuals and their companies to help us with that. So I'm, I am concerned that some of them may not make it, you know, with uh, the difficulties their businesses are having. So I would like to encourage all of our members to um, patronize them to the extent that they can or wish to. And hopefully we can keep everybody uh, going through this um, next period of time. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, spring training 2021. Much more to be heard about that. Here uh, on my screen, you'll see the excellent color-coded spreadsheet that Alan uh, has created. <laughs> so you can see there's a great variety of courses and oh, classes. Yeah. EJ is uh, holding something up there. We, we've got about 40 courses, I think. So there's a lot going on. Uh, but we have to first go through our, this with our executive, and that's early next week. And then we'll talk about it in more detail at the December 9th meeting and uh, in January, of course. So uh, with that, I think uh, we've finished all the little bit of business we had to. It's about quarter after seven, and I'd like to turn the meeting over to Mike Jackson, wherever he's gotten to. You're there. Still here. There you are. Okay, he's got that great background there. Go ahead, Mike. You're, it's your okay. I will just uh, get things started here. So. Oh, while he's getting them started, um, I think there's. He'll tell you when you could maybe get a word in and, and ask a question. But you can always use the chat. So if you have a question, something occurs to you, you don't want to forget it. You can use that little chat thing you see on your screen and write it down. And then Mike will look at those uh, as as his presentation unfolds, and and he'll get around to answering your uh, your point. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, just a second, I think. I think. Does that seem to be a slide there for everybody? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, back in August and September, I um, joined a, a group 
that uh, spent up to six weeks on the central coast uh, cleaning up parts of the outer coast of the Great Bear Rainforest. And um, the presentation I've got here will take about an hour and I've got a couple of spots that I'd like to stop and take questions because they, they kind of breaks into natural um, divisions. And I say lots of photos in here, um, a bunch of them of my own, but also uh, Friends of mine, Jeff Reynolds, Simon Ager, Sarah Hauser, Jackie, Jackie Wind, and, and a few others have all contributed. So um, without further ado, I think, let me see if this is gonna work. Uh, let me just, okay. okay. Um, so I wanna kind of give you an overview of what the Great Bear Rainforest is, and then talk about this project that's called the Marine Debris Removal Initiative, and then show you some of the stuff we found. So um, where is it? And you can see this entire area on the screen hopefully shows you what we call the Great Bear Rainforest. It's essentially the entire coast from kind of North Vancouver Island up to the Alaska border. So this is uh, Great Bear Rainforest or part of it on one of the river estuaries. And it's called the Great Bear Rainforest, but I think it should also be called the Great Salmon Forest. And the reason is that the salmon are basically what drive the ecology of this forest. So much so that um, researchers at UBC have found out that the isotopes of marine uh, stuff are found in the trees that are mm -hmm. growing along the rivers here. And the way it gets to them is through the animals that eat the salmon in the river and then bring them into the forest. So the, the forest is intricately connected to the salmon. So here we can see some salmon in a creek and hopefully the video is showing more or less. Mm -hmm. And here this is in a creek aptly named Salmon Creek near uh, near Klemtu. And we've got five, five species of salmon on our mm -hmm. coast mm -hmm. and uh, they all spawn in various parts of the Great Bear Rainforest. Some of them have two year cycles, some of them have six or seven year cycles, and they all differ in you know, when they spawn and where they spawn and how often they spawn, or sorry, uh, how, how many years in their cycle. And the, the key thing is that they're putting these eggs into the, into the creeks, which uh, over winter and hatch in the spring to uh, go back into the ocean and then they spend anywhere from say two to two to six years in the ocean. So here you can see some spawning salmon and once they spawned on this coast unfortunately the the Pacific salmon all die and, and in the process of dying they end up fertilizing the areas where they uh, where they tried to spawn. And the animals are all over. These are um, uh, Bonaparte skulls on the coast here. And you can see that they're all um, waiting for bits of salmon and salmon eggs. Here you can see a Stellar's jay uh, with its bout, uh, beak full of salmon eggs. And Stellar's jay, by the way, is BC's provincial bird. A uh, little pine marten. This was on uh, Gribble Island in the central BC coast. And we got a little grizzly bear on uh, Coots. Just a few more shots of grizzlies because they're cool. <laughs> and uh, this is one I saw last, uh, last fall up in the Kitlope. Oh, by the way, there's a lady up at UVic who is in the process of uh, putting together facial ID for salmon, which I think is, sorry, for bears, which grizzly bears, which um, hopefully will enable better management and better understanding of where these bears move to. And then we've got black bears. This one is on uh, Riordan Creek on Gribble Island. And one of the things that the Great Bear Rainforest is well known for is the spirit bear or the Kermode bear. And here you can see somebody taking a photograph of one of the bears. This guy is called Boss on Riordan Creek. So 
But in addition to the land-based forests, there's the kelp forests, which uh, support a great deal of life. And um, this uh, shows the ochre, ochre sea stars that used to be very, very common and are coming back in several areas of the coast. And I was actually very pleased this, uh, this past summer when I was up on the project to see some areas where the uh, ochre stars were really coming back. Of course, uh, sea otters are found up and down the Great Bear Rainforest. And these guys here um, are probably one of my favorite things to see on the outer coast of the Great Bear Rainforest, the humpback whales. And throughout the, the area, you often will see them diving as they are feeding on krill or on um, herring. And one of the really cool things about humpbacks <laughs> is the variety of their tails and the tails are um, are unique to an individual. There's, uh, I think I can put my mouse over here. This one is uh, called Galen and I think, uh, I don't see Zorro, oh there's Zorro, is up there. Um, so several of them have names and if you get, get pictures of the tails you can upload them to a site called Happy Whale and if, if somebody else has taken a picture of that same whale, you find out their, their, their whole history. And um, I've done that for several of these whales and these whales have been sighted going back to 2004, both in Hawaii and in the Great Bear Rainforest. So um, kind of a neat example of uh, what we can do with computers and the internet. Another important whale on the outer coast is the fin whale. And the fin whale is the world's second largest uh, whale. It's also the fastest of the whales. Mm. They can swim at up to 45 kilometers an hour. And uh, one of the things that I also enjoy about seeing these whales is that the orcas, the fin whales, and the humpback whales are all whales that I see up in BC, but I also have seen them in the Antarctic and in the Arctic. And of course the iconic uh, killer whales. These are some residents that were seen in uh, around King Island, Dean Channel. And from your boat, you can often see the uh, porpoises or the, these are Pacific white-sided dolphins and also porpoises, doll porpoises coming right below the ship and uh, they, they love to surf in the, the bow waves of the ship. And we also have uh, sea lions. These are all uh, stellar sea lions on uh, near Ashdown Island in the, just south of Campania. And you can see a large male. And uh, this is the ship that I work on, the Cascadia in the background. And another iconic species of the coast is the uh, coastal wolf. And this one was on Campania Island that we saw last year. And he proceeded to walk right in front of us, pretty much not caring about us. And then he swam right between us and the ship as he went from one side of the inlet to the other. And um, last but not least, on the central coast, we have several First Nations. Um, the project that we were involved with um, involved uh, at least five of the coastal First Nations in both getting permi permission and also doing some of the cleanup. And this is the inside of the big house. That was, sorry, by the way, was the outside. Um, in Bella Bella, they just completed this big house and had a potlatch to open it um, mm -hmm. October of last year. Okay, so before I move on, um, I can take questions on... Um, you can ask me oh, anything. Oh, shush. I need to turn my computer. My um, Google must have decided. So if anybody's got any questions about the Great Bear Rainforest before I move on to... I can't see the chat right now, so... Um, well, maybe I can. No, I can't see the chat. There's just a comment that Jeff Reynolds' photos are stunning. Jeff's 
photos are amazing. And uh, Jeff and I have worked together for Maple Leaf Adventures for six years now. And we also work together down in Antarctica. Okay, well, I will carry on to the expeditions here. And these marine debris removal um, initiative expeditions were conceived by Kevin Smith, who's the owner of Maple Leaf Adventures. And we collaborated with four other coastal tourism companies. And we also collaborated with the Coastal First Nations, the Wukanyu, the Kitasu Hehe, Heltsuk, and Gitkat. And uh, over a hundred um, people who worked for the various ship companies were employed for up to seven weeks, um, as this was partly a, uh, a government make work project. And we say we had several groups of First Nations that were also collecting debris. And basically we decided that um, our ships would do the outer coast, which was the harder to access, wh whereas the First Nations groups would do the more protected areas near their, um, near their villages. And the original plan was to remove about 20 or 30 tons of debris from the outer coast over the six, uh, the six weeks of the expeditions. And the cost uh, for the entire project, the entire six weeks was about three and a half million. And that included the helicopter fees, the barge and the disposal fees, which were quite substantial as you'll see later. And it came from a um, fund called uh, the Co Clean Coast Clean Waters Initiative. These were the um, four main um, First Nations that were involved and you can see that we basically made it kind of halfway up that map. Uh, we just barely entered Gitkat territory. Yeah. Mostly we were in Heltsuk and Kitsuhehe. These are some pictures of some of the ships that we were working on or working with. This is the Columbia 3 which is a classic uh, coastal boat that's been operating on the BC coast since uh, 1956. And I suspect, I wouldn't be surprised if some club members have actually been on uh, trips on board this. Uh, it's Mothership Adventures. They run, they run kayaking trips. And then Blue Water Adventures has a ship called the Passing Cloud. And then there's a small boat called uh, Great Bear 2 that takes, I think, four or five guests. And then Blue Water Adventures um, has... Uh, three ships, Island Solitude, Odyssey, and Romer, and they uh, kind of look similar, but they're all quite different. And then the Maple Leaf ships, and this is the kind of flagship of the Maple Leaf Company, the Maple, uh, Maple Leaf, which was built in 1904. And this is, uh, this we acquired uh, six years ago, the motor vessel Swell or the tugboat, it's a converted tugboat originally built in 1912. And then this is the Cascadia, which is the, the newest addition to the fleet that just started operation in uh, 2019. And that was the ship that I was working on. So again, back to the Great Bear Rainforest. You'll see a couple of maps here showing the Great Bear. And again, so satellite view, the magenta line there shows you kind of the area that we were primarily working in. And we kind of divided the area into a northern section and the southern section. And you'll see there's kind of uh, four white circles in the south and uh, three in the top. And uh, more on that later, but basically we, we managed all four of the south ones and only two of the north ones. We ran out of time. So there's kind of zooming in. And basically we started here at uh, Cape Caution Actually, Cape Caution is just south of there, but we basically started working here and made our way on the outside of Calvert Island, Hecate Island, Hunter, Campbell, and also the Goose Group in our first expedition. And then in the second expedition, we did the outsides of Price Island and about half of uh, Arista Zabal Island. So this is an image of a fairly typical piece of um, outer rainforest coast. And 
this was taken uh, in a 2015 flyby that was done by the provincial government. And you can see all those white blobs on the beach there on the shore. Those are huge pieces of styrofoam, probably roughly, you know, eight or 10 feet long by three or four feet by three or four feet. So they're huge chunks of styrofoam. And these were actually outside a place called St. John Harbor on Bardswell Island. So to kind of get everything, all, we had nine ships and we had to kind of coordinate everything. And this is a captain's meeting where we basically had everybody uh, discussing the plans and we had in-person meetings um, occasionally, but most often we would have a, a morning and an evening VHF call, which was interesting because quite often we were further apart than VHFs would reach and it was, communication was a real challenge. So this is uh, myself and Kevin Smith. We uh, worked very closely together to um, kind of coordinate the, the fleet and both the gathering of all the debris and then eventually the, the pickup. And a very important part of uh, the program was the helicopter. And this is Jason, who is our helicopter pilot. Um, Airspan helicopters out of Seashelt basically would come and once we had gathered all these bags, uh, they would um, they would pick them up and then deliver them to a barge. One of the main things that I was doing was uh, gathering all the, um, I was gathering all the location information for all the bags that were had been collected and then entering them into a database and then creating uh, GPS files that could be shared with both um, other ships and also with the helicopter pilot so that we could actually find the debris. And just uh, because this is a kayaking talk, I should definitely mention that um, I did have to use a kayak because we were still social distancing at this point um, of the trip. And we, I had to deliver all the waypoints to the other, uh, the other boats. And so I did that by taking a, a laptop with me and then airdropping it to people on their, um, on the other boats. This, uh, this map shows you um, basically all the dots represent where we, uh, where we put bags. And you can see some areas are very concentrated. Uh, the green dots were the first um, area and the purple dots were the second expedition. And I have actually made a, uh, a Google map of these that if anybody wants, I can send it to them but uh, it shows you, you can zoom in to the details of all, about 450 bag sites that we created. So the process, oops, I'm just gonna see if I can get something here. I don't know if I can clear, oh, anyway. Um, so the, the first phase of the process was gathering the debris and then we would weigh the debris and and bag it and make sure that um, the bags weighed less than 300 kilos because that was the maximum that the helicopter could pick up. And also uh, in some cases we would bring debris back to the ship for later transfer. And if we left the bags on shore, we had to make sure that they were well above the highest high tide line so they wouldn't get washed away. And then the second phase was uh, shore crews would uh, would relocate and then basically manage or uh, staff all the lift bag sites so that when the helicopter came there, they could lift the bag and then move on to the next one because the helicopter was a very expensive part of the whole process. And we wanted to make sure that the helicopter wasn't just hanging around doing nothing. And ultimately the um, bags and the debris were transferred to the barge and then to, were taken to Port Hardy where they were landfilled. So this, uh, the next few pictures are just a few pictures to show you kind of the process. Um, here is a, a team from the swell working on the shore that you can see typical styrofoam, blue barrels um, and all kinds of other debris that's being collected. 
sometimes we had large sections of pipe that had to be sawed up into uh, manageable lengths. Sometimes it was pretty mucky work, uh, digging nets out of, out of the mud. And here you can see a fairly typical high tide zone that just has m multiple kinds of different uh, fishing rope and line uh, that all had to be basically pulled out and, and bagged. For most of the smaller materials, we were able to um, weigh them as they went into the bags. And so we were able to keep track of the weights. And for larger items, we had to, uh, had to guess based on, you know, is this heavier than a luggage piece of standard piece of luggage or not? And as we completed every bag, we would note down its location and its weight and uh, some general characteristics of the um, of the debris. And here you can see, you know, a bunch of bags all waiting to be lifted. And there was a, we had to do a few uh, promo photos um, for the media. And of course we had to make sure we were all socially distant and wearing masks for the, uh, um, for the photos, even though actually at this point we were already past our 14 days away. Just another shot of a, a set of bags ready to be picked up. Here, uh, once uh, at one point we had to use a kayak to go and uh, access a shore because the the entrance into the little bay was so narrow and so rocky that um, no tenders could get in there. So we, we went in there by kayak and managed to pull out quite a bit of debris. As I say, sometimes we didn't uh, bag stuff. We just uh, piled it up and then moved it into the uh, tender. And what this picture doesn't show is that shortly after this, we all got soaked by a big wave that came in. And I say sometimes you can see here we filled up the the tenders with with debris. Sometimes we would uh, tow things out and tow them back to the ship. And I think the next what I'm hoping will work now is this is a, a time lapse. It's about 50 seconds that shows you um, what the cleanup of a particular beach looked like. So this was. Uh, the start and you can see we're all time lapsing here looking pretty busy one of the things that we found was if we could see one piece of debris on a log jam we basically knew pretty much that we had a bag's worth of uh, material on that beach and I, I guess beach is a very loose term for this, this particular site. There we go. And so this was the Helsic Horizon uh, barge. And so the, the barging company was 50% uh, owned by First Nations. And there was a crew of three on board the barge, as well as the helicopter pilot and his uh, safety officer. They did some training with us to make sure that we understood how the helicopter lift worked and um, that we all had the right safety gear and, and so on and so forth and knew the sit the hand signals and so on and so forth. And here's me set up for my first helicopter lift. And I say we, we would basically send two crew to a site and they would basically be ready to load, in this case, about eight or nine bags, um, sometimes in ones and twos, um, sometimes as many as three at a time uh, and hook them up to the, to the helicopter. It's quite a lot of waiting around because we had to make sure that there were crews in place. And so very often the, the, the what I call the, the heli 
ground crew would spend, you know, an hour or two or more just sitting on a beach waiting for the helicopter to come. And I think this next one here is hopefully a video that will I need to change this, sorry. Sorry, I've got my speaker is not set right here. I just got to try and change this again. Okay. Sorry, the audio is not coming through here. See if I can figure out the audio. You had it there for a second, Mike. Well, what I did is I took my headphones off and uh, kind of pushed the mic into the headphone, <laughs> but just towards the end there. That worked. Anyway, um, I might do that again. So this was our very first set of bags at uh, the Hakai Center, and we were very lucky that we actually started our operation at the Hakai Center because um, at the Hakai Center on Calvert Island they have a um, a Wi-Fi hotspot that's available and when the pilot arrived he had a, a, a weird GPS that um, we didn't have the drivers or the software for but I was able to download and install that and get it all figured out using the the Hakai Center's Wi-Fi but these were our first bags uh, being lifted off and the first bags being dropped into the waiting barge. And there's a bit later in the trip, you can see the barge is now fairly full. And these are just some typical um, loads of gear coming off, uh, off the site and everything from barrels, floats, and then all the smaller stuff is in inside the bag. And this is Nolan and Robert who are uh, two of the crew who are on the on the barge all the time. And that kind of gives you an idea of what the uh, tug and barge and helicopter looked like as a as sort of a, an operation. The pilot, uh, Jason, is just amazing. He was able to essentially uh, pinpoint where he wanted to put a bag and would drop the bag exactly where he needed to. So one of the biggest challenges on the trip um, was when we came to when it came to time for helicopter operations, and ironically, this happened both for both trips. While we were gathering the debris, we didn't have any trouble with fog, but as soon as we were about to do heli operations, the um, fog started to come in, and uh, the first day of each helicopter operation was actually a write-off because the helicopter couldn't arrive until a day later because of the fog. And then the next uh, three or four mornings, we often didn't get started until 11 or so because uh, we were waiting for the fog to clear. And just another shot in the fog. 
and you can see here the fogs, fogs coming in. One of the um, adventures that we had was uh, at the end of the second trip, we knew we couldn't go back to um, pick up left behind bags and we ran out of light on the, the last day of uh, operations and there was a storm coming in. So we knew we had to get everything um, off the shore. And so what we ended up doing was all the um, tenders from all the ships basically went to all the bags and they basically manhandled them into their tenders and brought them back to each of the ships. And then later that evening uh, at the south end of um, Price Island, near Day Island, we uh, basically craned all the bags back onto Cascadia. So we had actually emptied Cascadia and then we filled her up again. And here you can see a large uh, aquaculture float being uh, craned up. And then that's what it looked like the next morning. So you can see that was the, the aftermath. Those were all the bags that we couldn't pick up by helicopter on the first expedition, sorry, for, on the second expedition. So what we found, we found a lot of fishing gear and uh, you'll see some more of that. A lot of rope, everything from tiny to huge, lots of plastic bottles and a lot of styrofoam. And that basically is the, the majority of what we found. And we found some other stuff as well. So this picture here shows a fairly typical landing site and just kind of looking at it, you can maybe see that there's a little bit of stuff up there. I don't know if you can see where my mouse is. And um, you can see a couple of little bits of debris. There's a crab float there and a piece of styrofoam there, but it doesn't look like there's an awful lot. But when you start to actually look closely, and this is going up above at the, the grassy level, this is what we found. And this is completely untouched. And close up of that, just this is how the sea and the wind and the waves had piled all the debris up. And that's what it looked like after we had finished. So if I could show you that site or that picture, that's after we'd finished. And there was the same place before we started. And you can see that there's just a huge amount of material that's accumulating on some of these, some of these sites. Um, up in the higher areas of the beach, in amongst the logs, you'd often find these uh, uh, piles of bottles and foam and just beaches covered with debris. All kinds, of, almost all of it plastic or plastic based. Some uh, fishing, a lot of fishing industry material, a lot of fish nets. And again, another beach before we actually started cleaning it up. And you can see here looking into a bag, um, this is showing you kind of what's a typical bag full of stuff. You can see rope, you can see bottles, you can see foam, uh, a few containers and uh, looking inside another bag. This was a pretty typical, these were to me very, very typical bags of material. You can see part of a, a, a crock there as well. I think it was a left foot. And here you can see bags piled up on top of the barge, just giving you an idea of the amount of gear that was attached. And in general, we would gather gear or gather the debris into burlap sacks so that we could weigh it and then put it into the big, uh, the big white lift bags. By the way, the lift bags are about 1.3 or one and a third cubic meters in, in volume. Lots and lots of fishing gear, and most of the fishing gear um, was from afar, from the other side of the Pacific. And there you can see, you know, the size of all the fishing gear attached there is actually more volume than the, the two white bags.
And here you can see a whole bunch of uh, gillnet floats. I think these are um, used regularly in, in Japan. These styrofoam floats were very, very common. Then these smaller floats also uh, probably from Japan. And we found a lot of crab trap floats. And one of the things that I found interesting there was that the American crabbers all have to label their traps with um, the year and in some cases the boat, uh, the boat name. Um, so you can see the, uh, this one here, ODFW, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the, the ship name, Pacific Pride, and also the year. And then the, that's a Washington one, but we found them from Alaska, Washington, California, and Oregon. And some of them go back, uh, I think the oldest ones we found were about 2004 for the crab traps. Oh, sorry, 2002, that's that one. Now BC's crab floats are uh, different in that they don't have a tag, they just have a, a, a license number. And so this would be a typical BC crabbing float. We found so much in the way of uh, fishing nets and these fishing nets both, um, while they're floating in the water before they get on shore, they're uh, often trapping wildlife and getting entangled in whales and so on and so forth. But once they get onto shore, they start to uh, break down and, and sometimes they break down and then float off again. And then, and it was very satisfying to actually get a net out because very often the nets were tangled in amongst the logs and we had to leave our logs out of the way uh, to be able to get them free. And you can see here, this is how a net might have looked before we started to pull it out. And you can see that these have been there for a long time. We also found um, fishing, uh, fishing buoys. These Scotchmen were from a large uh, Ocean Pearl, which is a, um, a ship that operates uh, out of Victoria. And just to give you an example of the amount of rope that we would find in some cases, here this one bag was entirely rope. And looking at this rope, you can see how it's starting to fray. And as it frays, it breaks down into these tiny little micro particles or, and uh, those wash back into the ocean and contribute to the microplastics issues. And there's another example of a typical piece of uh, hawser or rope that had been washed off and is just breaking apart into tiny little pieces. And you can see here kind of before and after we had this rope was uh, stuck under the logs and then we eventually got it out. And uh, so Haley here was quite pleased with herself to have been successful in getting it out. And you can see some pretty substantial sized ropes. These are definitely big ropes for bringing in the ships. And plastic bottles. We had plastic bottles um, of so many different kinds and they came from Russia, Romania, Greece, Vietnam, Korea, China, Japan, and also Canada. But um, most of the bottles that we found were not local. And this would be a fairly typical uh, site in a beach. And when you first look at it, you don't see all, I can see at least one, two, three, four, five, six, six bottles in that one image and they really blend into the logs very easily. So this one here is from uh, Vietnam, from uh, China. This one's from Russia. This one's from, the middle one's from Greece. We've got Korean, 
liquor. And in many cases, the bottles had no um, writing on left on the bottle, but you could still see the caps and you can see the um, Chinese and Japanese writing on the top of the, the bottles. And I found this one and I thought there was a little bit of irony there with the uh, helping people in the planet. But uh, and that was actually one of the uh, Canadian items. You can also see that some of these bottles have been around for quite a long time in the in amongst the forest and are gradually breaking down. The other big item that we found or the big part of what we found was uh, styrofoam and some of the styrofoam was in big chunks like you can see here in the zodiac and other were small pieces. We had to uh, make a call fairly early on that we couldn't um, really pick up pieces that were much smaller than a, uh, a small fist because there was just so much of it in some, in some pieces. And here you can see a large, uh, we called it a foam berg because it was that big and bergy bit. And we got it into the, into the tender and uh, brought it back to the ship and loaded it up. And you can see here, it was actually being loaded, ready to be lifted to the barge. And here you can see these large kind of barrel sized uh, styrofoam floats. We saw lots and lots of these I mean, hundreds of these literally. And it wasn't until near the end that I actually figured out how they were set up. And you see this green one. And I think the next is a little video and I'm gonna try and see if I can get this to work again. Ernie, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound? So much of this debris that we've encountered comes from the international fishing industry. So this lift bag or this lift net, which is going to be one of our last loads of the six week expedition, has a classic example of these styrofoam floats. We've seen these styrofoam cylinders all over the coast. We've probably picked up several hundred of these during the course of the expeditions. But this one over here is an example of how they look when they're kind of in action. They're covered with this super light duty uh, green mesh and a bit of rope. And when those things fall apart, the whole thing starts to decompose. The rope breaks down, the mesh cover bag breaks down, and then eventually all the styrofoam itself breaks down. Okay, that little bag, bag full of uh, foam that I, or that net rather, had six of those foam floats in it. And say we found hundreds of those foam floats that uh, most likely came again from Asia. And I don't know if you can see in between the logs and the bushes here, there's all that white stuff in amongst the, uh, or just at the edge. And that is all styrofoam. And so we started calling these uh, foam middens and again, just another close up of the styrofoam middens where there was just so much styrofoam accumulating. And again, you can see how some of this styrofoam has been around for quite a long time. I wouldn't be surprised if these two pieces here had been there for 15 or 20 years or so. And some of it's growing into the forest or the forest is growing into it. And we found lots of other stuff. This was uh, piping that was pretty common or fairly common, I should say. And we think that this was piping used to provide fresh water to possibly aquaculture um, operations. Sometimes we found these uh, dock floats. This was an unusual one. Um, a, it was either a water tank or a septic tank. I'm not sure exactly how you tell the difference or maybe it could be either but um, 
It was one of the larger items that we found and were able to successfully retrieve. Lots of uh, various milk crates, say some from the USA, some from China. And over here at the last little bit here, I've got some, uh, some of the weird stuff and fun stuff that we found. And probably the most popular thing that we found were the glass balls. I don't have a tally of the total number, but I think between 30 and 40 glass balls were found by the fleet. And uh, here you can see some large ones and some small ones. And also over here, you can see one of the, uh, what they call rolling pin style. And we also found um, this one, this is uh, Eddie Savage, and he found one of these deep ocean balls and they are found in a, what's called a plastic hard hat. And they're designed to be able to go down to a depth of uh, almost six and a half kilometers or six, yeah, six and a half kilometers or 6,700 meters. And they act as um, part of an underwater mooring system. And I think, yeah, this next picture here, you can see the, the yellow plastic things on the right are what held onto the balls or those big balls. And then those would be attached to lift equipment off the bottom of the ocean. Uh, another thing that uh, we found, this was a, uh, a drift boy. And you'll notice that there was an email address on here. And I emailed the um, this address and got a reply. And uh, sure enough, this is actually a, um, a small, essentially science experiment where they were trying to study the, uh, the current flow along the coast. And they would have a little spot device embedded in the top. And this was the track you can see uh, made by that particular one. It was uh, set off near Campania Island and it made its way all the way down past Aristizabal and then it stopped working here and then we found it uh, on the beach over there by that yellow bush bin. Then the one I, one I found was a bit more high tech, um, had a Bluetooth and a, um, a QR code and everything on it, but also had the same um, same email address and I uh, contacted him and he showed, uh, told me where it had come from. It had been launched off uh, Cape Scott and had drifted down south of the Brooks and then back up to uh, just out of Quatsino. And then it was actually found up here, sorry, up near um, the top of the image, almost uh, level with a goose group. And that's what they look like when they're uh, when they were set off. There's one of the uh, discs and there's one of the other ones. And then we found this weird thing. And this is uh, still actually in my garage. It's waiting to be sent down to uh, California at some point. And we had no idea what this was other than we thought it was a weird science thing and we called it Sputnik um, for lack of a better name. And I got home and started to try and uh, track this down and eventually found this picture, which thought looked somewhat similar. And after a bit more Googling, found these guys. And it turns out that this is exactly what we had found. And it's, a, um, it's another current drifter that is designed to really stick with the water rather than the wind. The ones I showed you before, were very much surface motion, whereas this is more the deep water because this goes down to uh, 50 feet or 15 meters. And they would also have uh, technology inside them that would allow them to transmit to a satellite and then eventually to a ground station. And here you can see the, this is a map showing you kind of the global uh, drifter array, so that this is where these kind of buoys have been put out um, around the ocean to try and figure out which way the oceans are moving. And it gives them maps like this that allow scientists to understand the, uh, the flow of the oceans. 
We also found this guy, this uh, particular piece of tubing and, or sorry, cabling. And we actually have no idea yet what it was for other than it was probably some kind of a scientific communication cable, but we still don't know what it is. Um, there were a few things that we left behind. If the things were dangerous for us to pick up, like this barrel full of poison, we decided to leave that behind and just mark it and um, uh, identify it for the Coast Guard. Here you can see a blue barrel that was so deeply buried into the sand and under the logs that there was just no way we could get it. And there's another tire, again buried amongst the, uh, amongst the logs. And here we are near the end of the six weeks. And uh, this was actually the, the last bag lifting off the deck. And you can see here the barge uh, and Cascadia and the barge there is full with about 70 tons of debris in that, in that picture. And for scale, there's a bunch of people down uh, sorry, down here you can see individual people at the base and actually there's some people sitting on top of the pile there. And there was the uh, Cascadia crew very happy celebrating the fact that we'd finally finished our six weeks of debris cleanup. On our way home we got to see some uh, Pacific white-sided dolphins which was a lot of fun. And again, here, this is a familiar mountain, Mount Baker. We were on our way back home after about six and a half weeks away. And this next uh, little video I want to show you, and I'm gonna to have to take my earphones off. This. slightly faster version of the time lapse. And that basically wraps things up here. Um, for me, the uh, on that video it said 641 bags, but that was the number of bags, but there were another 50 or uh, more than 50 bag equivalents that, uh, you know, all those hitchhikers that we saw attached to the bags. And uh, right now I think I'm ready to answer any questions that people might have. So I'm just gonna stop sharing here for a moment so I can see. Quite a few questions there you'll see in the chat. Great, okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, um, oh boy, I'm gonna start at the bottom and then work back up, okay? <laughs> Do I feel like my effort made a significant impact in the amount of litter there in that forest? Um, most definitely. Um, the areas that we cleaned um, where 
when we left them, they were, you know, night and day different from what they were when we arrived. Um, there were some places that still had what I call the um, the styrofoam midden in there, but that was a, a kind of an impossible task. And there were a few places that we, there's, the debris was either too large or, or not. Um, yeah, not, we weren't able to do that. So um, how many people in total? Uh, there were nine boats, um, about a hundred people in total. Um, including, you know, chefs, captains, mates, deckhands, um, uh, naturalists, and, and so on. So these were all people who would normally um, work on board those ships as part of the tourist season and had their entire season cancelled. Um, okay, I'm going to go back. How many barges? Uh, one barge, and it uh, did two two trips. At the, so it did a trip at the end of each expedition. Uh, the first expedition, it went back with about um, 60 tons. And then the second expedition, it went back with about 70 tons. So I mentioned at the beginning that we had, um, we estimated about 20 to 30 tons would be collected and we ended up getting nearly 130. Uh, were we able to sell the glass floats? I don't think anybody sold them. I think everybody kept on, kept, kept them. Um, okay, I'm just going to go here. Um, yeah, the commercial fishers uh, don't plan on losing equipment that cost them and they lose the trap and catch as well. Um, it's hard to know, you know, how and why so many, so much of that debris. And this is the, this is the real challenge is, is understanding how the debris gets there in the first place. Was it, uh, was it just lost or was it, um, deemed uh, no longer useful um, or was it just lost in a storm? Um, the, I would say some of it was aquaculture debris. I see a question here, um, but I think most of it was commercial, uh, commercial large scale commercial fishing uh, from the international fleet. Japanese tsunami debris, it was very difficult to know if anything that we found was specifically tsunami. Um, it's possible that some of the tires and, and so on that we found and maybe some of the bottles or shoes, but it was really, it's when you find these bottles and pieces on the shore, knowing how they got there, the story behind how they got there is a, is a real challenge. Did we find anything valuable? Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess I, the glass balls are valuable to people, but, um, and uh, yeah, so the debris did go to Port Hardy landfill. Uh, we, once we realized the nature of the debris that we were getting there, um, we figured that we should be able to reuse and recycle some of it, though a lot of it, I have to say, was probably too contaminated to be uh, usefully recycled. And so in this project, um, virtually none of the material was recycled. We did keep a lot of the, um, what we call dragger balls, those kind of large, um, I don't know, 12 to 17 inch diameter, uh, hard plastic floats. And, um, They, they were actually given to the Helsuk at the end of our first expedition so that they could use them as part of their um, herring row, sorry, herring row on kelp uh, fishing program. So they basically would, would, you, would be reusing those floats. Um, and, uh, 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 looking at all those logs and wondering if there were any injuries. Um, I would say there were minor injuries. There were a few sprains. Um, uh, but no, no major, uh, no major injuries. And did any of the bags break while being lifted out? No, the bags are actually rated for a thousand kilos and the heaviest we made them were, were 300. So the bags were plenty strong enough. Um, how did we get debris out of the log piles? Basically sort of engineering, we would find other logs and lever logs out of the way. Um, and 
Okay, I'm gonna go on down here. Um, are there likely to be future expeditions and how does one get involved? Well, in this particular project, it was uh, the way to be involved was that uh, we were working for one of the companies that was part of the project. And again, this was kind of a, a, two, a twofold project. It was a COVID recovery um, industry support, tourism industry support project, but also um, doing doing good as a result of it um, and yeah so i'm just looking uh, do, 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 do. looking at any of the questions here yeah i think that um one of the things that is is happening and, and gene has just mentioned this that uh, new regulations are being developed to tag and identify gear and that will certainly hopefully apply specifically to the to the BC gear. I think it's already uh, relevant to the US gear, but um, with the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? With, um, with a lot of the international gear, and I would say probably more than 50% of what we found was international, not, uh, uh, not North American. Um, getting that getting that tagged and identified would be a real challenge and somebody mentioned uh, couldn't we get rid of it by burning um, yes but unless you can burn things at a very high temperature the gases are extremely to toxic um, can you reuse the the big white bags i think if we were doing this again we would figure out a way to um, uh, essentially empty the bags at the end and and reuse them but we we weren't able to on this project i should mention that one of the things that happened was that this project was originally proposed in i think april of this year but we didn't get the go-ahead to go until early august and we had to leave mid-august so we actually had a week in which to get everything together and the boats up and running and up the coast to do this. So um, it was done at extremely short notice. If anybody else has questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and then and ask as well. And if I didn't answer your question, I've kind of, I think I scrolled through all the questions that I could see in the chat. Do I feel the remoteness of the beaches was responsible for the high concentration of foreign materials? Um, I would say the fact that they were exposed to the open coast, yes. So I would, I would expect you would find the same foreign material concentration on the west coast of Vancouver Island, because um, you know the, the west coast of Calvert and Price and um, uh, Barista's about are all kind of similar facing and uh, and so that, that's why uh, you know the, I would say that the the international is because it's it's open to the Pacific. I think if you looked at kind of inner coast waters, you'd probably find a lot more local. Um, and BJ's got a question. Um, gear and skilled individuals were available due to COVID. Um, I think it's possible. It's 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 definitely being discussed, and um, I, know, I think one of the things that was important about this project is we had a lot of um, we had a, a group of ships that were able to spend you know three weeks away from anywhere uh, without um, having to go ashore or going to a port, uh, completely self sufficient, and also the crew were were trained mariners who were able to. Um, or basically practiced in landing ships and, and uh, the dinghies on, on the, these somewhat uh, sketchy shores. Um, and yeah, where did the trash end up uh, from Fred? That's uh, uh, Port Hardy is where, where it ended up. And again, I, I, would, I would say that I would call this um, debris rather than trash because I don't think the vast majority of what we found, I don't think was thrown away. It was either lost by accident 
or um, you know a or storms or um, yeah you know, or industrial activities, but it, I don't think it was uh, uh, what's the word? Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it's it's necessarily trash as such. Uh, quite a few of the bottles, and again, even with the bottles, we don't know if they were thrown off a ship or if they were uh, floated down a river. Um, and I say identifying the the source location of these of of so much of this material was extremely challenging. Pretty much the only things that I can be sure of where they came from would be the uh, the tagged Oregon, Washington, California, and Alaska crab traps, the um, the gizmos that came from the Institute of Ocean Sciences up here in Pat Bay that we found. And um, yeah. Okay, what else? Yeah. Um, what else can I think of? Any, any other questions or comments? I'm happy to... Uh, entertain any more questions either by voice or by chat. Mike, do you know yep. if there's kind of international initiative to uh, place an environmental fee on uh, fishing gear? I'm not aware of anything to that, um, to that idea, though it's, it sounds like it would be a fantastic idea. One of the things I actually wanted to mention is since coming back, I've, um, I've looked at pictures of marine debris around the world and what we see on our coast is pretty much the same that you see on the coast of Australia, pretty much the same as you see on the coast of Scotland in places, um, pretty much anywhere in the world where you've got kind of open ocean exposed coasts, you're going to find debris that's very similar to this. So it's, it is a global problem. And I would I would guess that over 50% of what we found did not come from North America. Well, that's why it'd have to be international, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. And, okay. but I, I think that, you know, uh, figuring out how to prevent the, the loss of this material or the disposal of this material. It's hard to know if, you know, these, some of these ropes or some of these um, nets were just, were accidentally lost or whether they were just said, well, this net is no longer any good. Uh, let's just let it go. Well, I, I suspect there'd be a little bit more care taken too if there, there was a substantial um, environmental fee attached to purchasing new gear. Yeah. I mean, there could also be fees associated with um, or deposits essentially on the return of the material. Mm -hmm. So I mean, in the same way as we have recycling fees, but um, yeah. Get on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, it sounds like uh, we've run down on the questions. Uh, that was great, amazing, actually. I mean, quite startling, but uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Mike. That was great. I don't know if you can do a little clap out there, but I, I certainly appreciated it. Thank you all. No, it's a real pleasure to uh, share, share our experience. And I say I had, leaving, leaving Victoria in mid-August, I had no idea what we would expect to find. And, I say we were kind of thinking, oh, we might find 20 or 30 tons, and we found four times that much. And um, the sheer quantity of, I say, uh, these these fishing floats that we found, and the styrofoam that we found was just staggering. And um, I know that the, the styrofoam floats that were part of that little video clip that I showed you, those are extremely cheap to manufacture and use and are used in many parts of uh, Southeast and uh, East Asia. So, yeah, I don't know what the solution is for that and trying to figure out how to deal with this. Um, 
And I just saw somebody, talk, uh, BJ just talked about doing a Cisco cleanup. Um, since doing this cleanup, I've, I've obviously become much more attuned to seeing, to seeing debris. And I've noticed there's a lot of debris around Chatham and Discovery Island right now. Um, but we would need permission to do that. But I think that if we were to do that as a club, that could be kind of a neat project. There's, there's certainly a lot there. There's probably at least one or two lift bags worth that I've seen around the coast of Chatham and Discovery. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, well, thanks so much. And uh, typically, again, uh, those of you in Cisco who know, know Mike Jackson, uh, you know, very, uh, very humble and unassuming. He, he probably failed to mention he was the uh, deputy of this, of this whole expedition and so played a, a significant role in it, as well as, you know, the six or seven weeks of his life that went into it. So we, we sure, sure appreciate it, Mike, and uh, we appreciate the uh, sort of uh, awareness that you bring to our club when you bring these stories back. So thanks so much for that. Could I ask yeah. one more question or just yes. say something? Yeah, for sure. I, I went and muted myself. Um, so do you remember Dave Spittlehouse? Yep. He used to annually do a cleanup to Discovery Chatham. Yeah, I helped with that quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. and that stopped when he stopped organizing his casual paddles. Mm -hmm. So it's something pretty easy to set up. Well, not easy to get the stuff off the island, but easy enough to set up a date and go mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. So we just need somebody in the club to put up their hand. BJ, <laughs> your idea. <laughs> One thing I might like to add is that um, if further funding is successful, there are uh, about 15 to 20 organizations that have come together as the BC Marine Debris, uh, Debris Working Group that are coordinating future cleanups. And part of that, like the South Island and Southern Gulf Islands are going to be administered or coordinated by Nikki Wright, who has recently given presentations on eelgrass. And um, it would be possible for local paddling clubs to become involved, I'm hoping with the people who are doing West Coast Vancouver Island next year to coordinate groups of paddlers to go out and help with cleanups because most of, most of the um, uh, retrieval, which is a, the single greatest cost, is going to be handled by organizations that have the capacity to do it. So it's really making it a lot easier for people that have an interest to go out in their kayaks and contribute to a cleanup without having to then take on the responsibility of transporting the debris off the beaches and to recycling depots and so forth. So it uh, opens up a whole new opportunity for individuals to get involved too, providing that they have the, uh, the skill set to go out to some of the more remote areas on the west coast or other areas around Vancouver Island. But that, those initiatives are going to be taking place in 2021, all the way from Haida Gwaii right down to Victoria. Very good, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, I think we've, uh, we've learned quite a lot this evening and we probably have a bit of a challenge as well. So that's nice to have. Thank you so much for calling in. Uh, we hope that you get out there and uh, paddle, of course, in your own way and uh, stay safe, stay well, and uh, enjoy, we hope, uh, some better times to come. We're all trying to be a bit more COVID safe right now. And remember, December 9th, we'll have a call again. So thanks again. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.